Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salam Allah alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to welcome everyone to another conversation we're having. And I am so excited about my guest today. I uh, I call him a brother from another mother. My beloved brother, Ahmed Fahmi. Ahmed, salam alaykum. Wa alaykum as wa barakatuh. It's so, it's so good to see you. Ahmed, I have to start by saying, you know, uh, subhanAllah, I, I miss seeing you and I miss being with you in Istanbul because you're still living in Istanbul, aren't you? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. I miss you. I miss you every day. My wow. uh, my gym partner, my uh, <laughs> you are my brother from another mother, subhanAllah. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know. it's, it's amazing. Ahmed, I don't think a lot of people know, uh, you know, uh, I, well, you know, Ahmed, I actually met you, in, though Ahmed does not remember this. He actually <laughs> doesn't happen. It never happened. And he breaks my heart every time. I met him when he was a student at Rutgers University. And him and I had this whole conversation. And to this day, Ahmed, you still swear that it never happened and you don't even remember wow. it. Could have been my brother. No, it was not. He was <laughs> like he was he was too young. So Ahmed and I, we had moved the same time to Istanbul, Turkey, to be part of the Sahba program, and Ahmed continued living in Istanbul. Ahmed, why haven't you left Istanbul? Why are you still there? It's the best place to live. It's Allah the best Allah. place to live. It's. Uh, I mean, wh where do I start? I can start with it's really cheap. <laughs> You know, that's, that's, that's good. You know, I can avoid the $500 Costco uh, trips and it's just a beautiful place in terms of the, the amazing people that come here. Like it's, it's been like this gravitational pull to so many amazing families and the history. And you just, you know, a couple of feet from my house, there's a message that's built in the 1500s, you know, two, you know, two blocks down built in, you know, the 1600s. It's just, it's just living in a postcard sometimes. It's not without its fault, but it's an amazing place to live. And and really, yeah. thanks to you. I mean, you know, th thank you for the, the program. The you you selected Uskudar, which was unknown, and you know, so many, so much thanks, so much khair came from you and from Medina and from yeah. No, you know, the, the beauty for me, I mean, it's like you said, there's some, there's the spiritual electricity about Istanbul, you know, it's like the civilization of Islam and, you know, of all the, Mas Ahmed and I, we live down the street from each other. So the beauty, mm -hmm. beauty about it was like, you know, if we we're going to buy tomatoes or cucumbers, we would run into each other, you know, in the streets and we worked out together all the time. And that's, that's going to be our large portion of our conversation today is going to be about, you know, spiritual and physical fitness. Uh, yeah. But I just, I want to take a memory, walk down the memory lane of Istanbul. Captain Pasha Jami Ahmed. I love and miss that masjid. I, 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 there's something about that masjid. And, and what's amazing is that it's just a normal mosque. You know, you just walk in and it's a work of art. And it's empty most of the time. It's just, and it's two blocks from me. And I never pass it without thinking, wow, this is so beautiful. Love At that. night, outside, inside, yeah. you know, and, and you know, the, the, there's something special here. Even the, there's a masjid, the most nondescript masjid, which is on my block. The imam loves to have children so much so that mm -hmm. he's like laid out toys now and candy in the masjid. And when he, and whenever he ims, he takes one of the kids with him. He says, Bir uh, Buchuk Imam. So Ooh. one and a half imam. And, uh, <laughs> You've been practicing Turkish, Ahmed. Well, you, you have to. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's so much. Actually, you know what we should do, Ahmed, one time is you yeah. and I should get on and just talk about Istanbul, life in Istanbul, the whole experience of moving. I think that would be, a, I think our, our listeners would love to hear that. And it also will take us down many memory lanes. But let me set up things from my perspective. You know, we moved, what year was it? 2017, Ahmed? Yep. You know, and uh, I was, you know, at that time, initially I was in decent shape and uh, the stress of the program over years, I sort of, you know, uh, Start, I'm a stress eater, Ahmed. I'm a stress eater. I'm going to just yes, put that I, rem I remember. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I love sweets. Like the thing about Istanbul is like if you're a stress eater and it's not like the United States, like, you know, every other store is like a fresh bread or it's like the best pastries or it's the best kebab. And so you're walking down the street, you know, you can have a 5,000 calorie meal without even thinking about it. And uh, I put on a lot of weight. And I, yeah, and I wasn't, I wasn't happy about that. And Ahmed there in Istanbul uh, helped me shed it. So just a bit of a background, mashallah, about Ahmed, uh, though he's a consultant, a business consultant. He is also a fitness aficionado. 
uh, Ahmed, uh, you, you did a what is it the the iron was it the Iron Man or the uh, what did you yeah, do in the, the Iron Man and the Ultraman and the Ultraman? Man. Can you talk about the Ultraman? What did you do in the Ultraman? The Ultraman was in North Wales. It was a ten kilometer swim or six point two mile swim, and then about I think it was about three hundred mile bike ride, and then a fifty two mile run. Like, and this is all over the span of how long? Uh, you have three days to finish it. Oh, what yeah. what made it difficult wasn't so much the distance was the I don't know if you have, you know about North Wales it's it's t terrible you know weather wise and terrain wise and just miserable you know hypothermia type stuff and then you also ran across the the Moroccan desert like you something like what was yeah, that yeah. all well not across the whole thing or two hundred fifty kilometers in the Moroccan desert and and that was the span of how long that you have um, that was uh they drop you off about two hours west of the last city called warzazat where actually the message was uh, filmed uh or some of the fight scenes from the me the message was filmed they take you in military vehicles like uh, i think it was like two three hours into the desert and it's over a span of seven days every day with its own different challenges like you're you're, you're running with your own pack and every all the food you need for the seven days and and uh a flare gun and all that kind of stuff. And, and where are you sleeping in the desert? Like, like, okay, it's time to go to bed. Where, where are you sleeping uh, in the desert? The Bedouin set up tents for you. It's actually really amazing, you know. And, and subhanAllah, I remember like saying, like, uh, you know, our religion really makes a lot of sense in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. In that, you know, you 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 finish your stage, and there'll be sand everywhere, and then you you come back to the camp, and everyone is like. You know, doing this and like trying to get, you know, non Muslims. I'm just saying, you know, they're right. basically making wudu because that, you know, the sand is everywhere between their toes. Like, you know, you have to get between your toes and all this kind of stuff. And every night we'd watch the moon rising. Well, like, imagine like the absence of light pollution and the absence of noise and the absence of, you know, like, there's no, obviously, there's no Starlink or back then or cell right. towers. And so you'd go outside, you'd watch the moon rise and look into the stars and then. Then you go to sleep. That's incredible. Yeah. You naturally wake. You're so exhausted. You naturally wake up before Fed. Mm. No, no need for an alarm clock. You sleep so. You sleep on the floor, which is kind of cool. You know, physically, well, and literally cool. Um, it just it was it was an amazing experience. You also flew to the moon, didn't you, Ahmed? I mean, you're like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I tell everyone Ahmed's Superman to me. Like, I'm like, <laughs> when you're telling me all these stories. I'm like, what? Did what? Yeah, no, Did what? No, no. So. So that background of Ahmed, I, I turned to him and I said, Ahmed, you need, you need to help me get in shape. And I was having a lot of, you know, I was just having a lot of difficulties. And alhamdulillah, you know, through the process that Ahmed put me on and he really was there side by side with me is an amazing, you know, you're you're my sheikh of fitness, you know, sheikh of uh, getting in and shape. And you're my sheikh of sheikh. Oh. You're my sheikh of Islam. No, it's, 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 subhanAllah, like, it, it, you know, I, although you're about to say a lot of nice things about me, you know, Allah put us both in our, each other's path, you know. You know, the fact that I've helped you fitness wise is pales in comparison to, you know, how you've helped me and the program you created and how you help my family. And so it's uh, a beautiful family, Ahmed. And so Ahmed helped me lo lose like 30 pounds. And so, Ahmed, you know, there's a lot of people out there that want who are probably in my same position. And uh, you've you've helped so many people out there. You know, I, I felt there was a, like a mental block you know, yeah. for me to start or restart the process of getting yeah. into physical shape. Talk to me about that. Like, why do you think that was? And what are some of the things that people can do to, to really try to turn that corner and start this process? I think and why, and also why, why should they start this process? Well, you, you know, getting in shape is pretty self-explanatory. It's uh, like nobody, I haven't met anyone that says, you know, I, I don't want to be in shape. Mm. Um, you know, the whys are so well documented, well understood. You know, you want to live a certain life, you know, way, feel a certain way. And but, but I think the more interesting question that I've observed is why not? Why? why what's stopping people? Mm. And it's 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 generally what I found is. I don't know how to put this other than people are generally miserable and stressed and they need a way to feel good very quickly that's it you know it's 
and and that's where where the challenge starts is that that thing is usually food and most likely while you're sitting down i once asked somebody i was like he's like hey can you help here actually in istanbul hey can you help me uh, and i said okay can you tell me your relationship with food mm. and he said wow it's an interesting question because he was expecting me to say hey let's go for a run he said you know i eat when i'm stressed i'm eat when i'm happy i eat when i celebrate I eat when I hang out with my wife. I eat when I'm taking my kids out. He like whatever the trigger is, whether positive or negative, the response is eating. Mm. And so it's understanding your relationship with, you know, that particular thing, which is food. That's sort of that's where it starts for me. And and different people have different ways of feeling good. You know, some people are stressed and like, I want to feel good. It's all about, you know, hack the, the whole dopamine system. That could be binge watching Netflix. Uh, but for them, or, or it can be looking at something on the internet. Or it can be many, many different things just for this immediate, for some people just look at Twitter and argue about politics. I need some immediate dopamine. But for the majority of people, it's, it's, uh, wanting to feel good and food is the easily easiest most readily available thing now yeah you know it's interesting you're saying that Ahmed, because it seems like so many of our interactions is always centered around a meal eating yeah. you know yeah. let's go out for a bite let's go out to do this let's go out to do that and so it seems like what ends up happening is that we just are packing on you know all of these calories non-stop without even number one recognizing you know how much we're actually eating yeah, it's exactly. I mean, your your life is almost centered around food, and and uh, and then human nature is optimized for wanting to feel good, but interestingly enough, also wanting not to feel bad or to feel pain. And so, when you take both of those things together, not you know wanting to feel good immediately, and not wanting to feel pain, you can't get fit without feeling pain. Mm. You know, you, you can't get bigger, you know, muscle wise without literally feeling pain. Like once, you know, it's like uh, it's like Muhammad, you know, Muhammad Ali said, you know, I don't start counting when I start doing the, the you know, the exercise. I start counting when it hurts. So you have this thing of like in order for you to get fit, you have to uh, literally feel pain and you have to avoid the thing that makes you feel good, both of which we are optimized for. And we're fed constantly, you know, like you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to even have the boredom of going to the bathroom. Take your phone in with you and then you can just do a scroll in the bathroom. Like, so it's like so Crazy, right? everything around us to help us avoid, you know, pain and to feel instant gratification. And I think that's at the heart of why people find it very difficult to get fit. It's not yeah. about the app, yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's not about the absence of like a a program, and and that's why people say, "Hey, send me your program. Send me what you have for breakfast." Or you, we go on the internet, and say, "Hey, daily, you know what does you know Chris Bumstead eat in a day?" And you're right. sitting there literally watching it as entertainment. Yeah, it doesn't do any, doesn't do anything for you, you know. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that because, you know, I, I was one of those guys, too, who had watched all these people getting in shape. Like, oh, very interesting. And somehow in my mind, like, OK, uh, I'm, I'm along with the journey. But, but yeah, exactly. I'm, but, in, in, you know, in the spiritual realm, you know, and, and through the process of, you know, purification of the soul, it's the same concepts. Right. So exactly. if you want to get in shape physically and spiritually, stop backbiting, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop even overeating, stop indulging. And you have to put more output when it comes to the spiritual work, do more remembrance of Allah, pray more, give more sadaqah. And so it's like this, uh, I have always found that the realm of getting in spiritually uh, fit, being spiritually fit and being physically fit, they're always connected. And one thing I noticed, Ahmed, about myself, when I'm physically unfit, I'm spiritually unfit. Yeah. And if I'm in good spiritual shape, I'm usually in good physical shape. Like there's just always like tied in together, at least in my life. Absolutely. I mean, it's I completely agree with that. And the the parallels are so, you know, as you sort of conquered one thing, let's say you conquered the physical stuff and you, you get into, you're trying to now conquer the spiritual side. The same, it's almost Allah creates, like, you know, has created these universal laws that apply to everything. And it's, you know, so 
if you want to get fit, it's all about delayed gratification. Right. You know, you're avoiding the delicious thing now, and you're and you're gonna do the hard work and pain now for this much great. You taste this much greater sweetness of health and vitality, or aesthetically, you look better, and all those things. And then same thing. Same things, uh, you know, spiritually. You have to avoid everything that makes you happy instantly right. and do things that you don't want to do for, to taste something that I haven't tasted yet but is infinitely sweeter than, you know, the gratification of backbiting, you know. And, and you know, even just on, on a, a, a separate note, you know, I'm always, always like, you know, when you look for something, like if I tell you, hey, red car, you'll see red cars everywhere. Right? right and you know so you, you see what you're you're constantly looking for or thinking about and so you know you had mentioned to me non non-stimulant pre-workout right 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 so i went i bought it right i went and i was like i went and bought it i bought this 50 dollar tub of stuff okay. right that uh you take and you're like you you're start tingling and all this kind of stuff and yeah. and so i'm looking on the internet and you know like does this actually work right. and like the jur the jury's out but but one one fitness trainer said you know like just just the intentionality of like do like mix putting in the pre workout mixing it at the right thing and is it indicates to you that the thing you're about to do is like really important mm. right and it's so it's like it creates this um, this routine that actually improves your workout by the way he said fifteen percent whether or not the actual compounds had anything to do with it so I was like thinking I'm like. Wow, we have wudu. It's like if we just change wudu from you know to, to pre salah, that's mm -hmm. exactly. The, you know, it's almost like there's this thing that I just do very very quickly. You know, just you know, and it's almost like there's so many. Once you're looking at like parallels between you know our spiritual practices and 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 the physical practices. Yeah, it reminds me of every time I used to bench press with you. You used to what was it? Mu muscle mind, muscle mind, <laughs> yeah, my, my muscle connection. Yeah, <laughs> connection. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're like, no, no, no. You really need to. You need to yeah. be in the moment. And what Sheikh Mukhtar would always teach us, you know, with our sada and with our dhikr, you know, is being in the moment, yeah. right? So it's like if if you and I are going to go pray, and we're just kind of like a chicken, like you know pecking on the ground oh okay well what are we getting out of that sada but if we're taking our time with the spirit mind muscle connection i don't know you can come up with some sort of you know phrase yeah. uh it, it does have an impact it leaves an impact and fairland really when i started listening to my uh, fitness guru here and uh, started to concentrate more on my reps i'm like wow you know i i, I would actually feel that more and so it's, it's amazing parallel in these realms but i mean i want to set up a scenario for you you know because a lot of our listeners and just like even myself, you yeah. know, recognize that, hey, yeah, I, I have some weight I need to lose. I, and I recognize that uh, I'm in a place that maybe is unhealthy and uh, maybe yeah. I'm taking medication for my diabetes. But, you know, I'm just so scared to change my habits and start this. Like, you know, what advice do you have for everyone to start to turn the corner? Uh, I would advise three things. Okay. You know, the first is people respond well to a sense of urgency and purpose. So an example could be, um, you know, I'm, I'm pre-diabetic and I'm about to get diabetes and I'm, I need to change something. Or like that's a sense of urgency. I'll have to do something. Or, you know, you're a smoker and then they find something on your lungs. I have to do something. Right. There's a sense of urgency. And, and most people that actually creates change. So you, you almost like imagine like the person is frozen, you have to create a sense of urgency in that person. And I think a more powerful thing is like manufacturing purpose. And, mm -hmm. and the way I, I do that personally is I like register for something. Okay. Like a half marathon, a marathon. Like I register for something that manufactures that purpose in my life. Mm. And so that that's the first thing. and. And, you know, you mentioned some of my races, whether it was from the my first thing. And what you didn't give is my background background, which was for all of my friends in high school and college watching something like this, they'd laugh. I was the least fit person. Mm. I don't have any background in any of this stuff. Like my background is playing with my computer, mm. you know. And so as I did everything from 5K to 10K to 
half marathon to marathon to Ironmans to Ultramans to the desert stuff and all the I would always register for the thing first before I was ready. Mm. So, that, so the first step was a kind of manufacturing purpose, right? That, that's why I created the race. We'll talk about it later, but yeah, definitely we have to talk about that. You know, it's so that's the first thing is manufacture purpose. The second thing is that I take out. I find there's so much power in having a coach in all realms. Mm. You know, I, you know. So you said I'm a business coach, right? But I mean, a nutrition coach or or somebody if i'm not paying somebody who's teaching me or a mentor of some sort but i pay i pay for all of these people because it creates a higher level of accountability like i am paying for this person's time uh, and so let's just say even though i've been doing this stuff for like 15 years i still have a running and triathlon coach mm. and they hold me accountable they ensure that I'm imp actually improving because there's a question like, how do you know you're actually improving? Quran, I, I don't even memorize by myself. I have a, you know, I have in every uh, facet of my life either a coach I'm paying for or a mentor that's mentoring me. So you have so someone, someone there to hold you accountable for some of the goals that you've set. Yes. So it's really, so let's start saying, okay, I want to set a goal. Yeah, and I set a goal. Yeah. And your exactly. goal is saying, you know what, instead of just being a guy who's just haphazardly walking around, in three months from now, I want to be able to run a half marathon. Or Yeah, exactly. Well, it depends on the level. I mean, this whole thing is levels, right? So like the goal, I said manufacture purpose. The goal has to be sufficiently interesting enough to actually create purpose. So for, for everyone is different. Like there's a guy visiting me here. Uh, his name is Mohammed in Istanbul right now. And for him, the, to make the goal interesting, has to, it's a hundred mile run. Okay. And for other people, a, f a three mile run is like is equivalent to the hundred mile. So it's it's all different. Yeah, that's that but would be would, that would be me, Ahmed. I think at this yeah, point, yeah. No. Like I I know somebody here who the idea of a three mile run, he didn't sleep the night before because oh. that's where he is. In his, but he, so you get the goal that's not going to break you, but sufficiently scare you, you know, and register register before you're ready whereas you know your nefs or whatever you want to call it will say no i'm not ready let me just get ready then i'll register no it's right. the exact opposite you register then get ready and then the second step because it's like how do i get i mean even in, in, in the world of islam like how do i get to this promised land spiritually mm. the most powerful way is to have somebody guide you right you know yeah. and so that that's step two is take the thinking out of it uh, by hiring, which is my ideal, like put your money where your mouth is, uh, or having someone to guide you. Yeah. And, and you know, what's interesting about these concepts we're going to get into. I think, you know, once I know for a fact, once I went through that process with you and I started to, by Allah's grace, accomplish some of those goals that we had, uh, that feeling of accomplishment was so much greater than my stress eating <sighs> of the trade of case a uh, hakizadi in uskadar city center like you know whereas the pleasure was eating that you know those delicious baklava that they have there hakizadi now it was like you put it in front of me i was like absolutely not i'm not going to touch i'm not even interested in it because i have exactly. an objective yeah and, and and that when you see the objective and the reward of that objective and and it's all it's all about like for me creating the systems in place until you get to that point. So right. people get to a point where, like like you said, the idea of hacky zaddy is like okay, no, whatever, you know. Yeah. It's but the idea of getting to a you know a, a delayed goal is far greater. And then the question becomes, how do you create those feel those those systems or that feeling in other aspects of your life, whether work or. Uh, ideally spirituality yeah and Ahmed, what's interesting about this is like you know the idea of having to suffer in that initial period of time like you know there's a lot of people out there who are addicted to many things whether it's pornography or or whatever it may be that they know these are spiritual vices that are destroying their hearts destroying their minds and putting them into like a, a spiral and out of control and they want to stop, but it's the courage of going through that, uh, you know, uh, what, what do you call it in medical terms when you're addicted to something uh, and you, you, they're, they're trying to help you uh, remove that addiction. Oh, my God, where's my vocabulary? Uh, becoming unaddicted, you know, or, 
are becoming sober, the pain of going through that sobriety sort of process. Like, you know, we had an, uh, we had a, uh, something that we did. We have a Thursday Vicar group here, right? And uh, we gave everyone an exercise. And the exercise was that for the next month, you cannot backbite or speak ill of anyone. Yeah, yeah. All of your phone calls, anyone that you call and talk to, if you want to speak about anyone, you have to speak about them in a positive way, a way that if they heard themselves, they would be happy with. And, you know, people who sincerely tried this exercise, Ahmed, they came to me and they're like, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. But once I did it, I felt so liberated. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's these things of like backbiting or you mentioned pornography or any of these things, like these addictions, people are not addicted to those things specifically. Mm. What they're addicted to is that that is their mechanism to feel good in the moment. Mm. You know, they, they're miserable and they need to, they want to feel good, you know, and 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 backbiting feels good. It's nice to, you know, there, you know, the, and what backbiting does, why, why does it make you feel good? Because you're talking about the ills of somebody else rather than thinking about mm, your own self, your own problems, your own self. So it's like very convenient. Oh, look, at them. they're worse than, oh, well, look at them. They're worse off than us or me yeah. and all that kind of stuff. What a loser. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff, when I think back down to the root cause, I mean, the only difference with, uh, food addiction is you can see somebody's you know you know uh, thing of choice you know uh, yeah. whereas it's very you don't see it with other other vices yeah and you know what's interesting about this ahmed you know ahmed and i we uh, we spend a lot of time uh, speaking about imam ghazali and the ihya alum and whenever we well, take you, you, you spend a lot of time talking about him i go mm, interesting <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's a good point and, and we'd have this thing i would always as we were walking and ahmed would bring a point up i'd be like uh, you know what he says you know what the sheikh says mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and ahmed would know that it's a reference to see the abu hamad al ghazali and you know uh actually he, he speaks about this concepts of you know being addictions and and he, he, he talks about uh, during his time in Iraq that there were people that would go out into the middle of the desert at the hottest point of the day just to play with pigeons. And mm -hmm. he's like, they'd be thirsty, they're getting sunburned, but they're finding this pleasure in playing with these pigeons and training yeah, these yeah. pigeons what to do. And he said, just like they learned behaviorally to deal with the pain of the sun at the zenith of it, in the middle of the desert, we can learn how to go through that same pain process initially to detach from those attachments and attach ourselves to things that are better for us, but we'll only realize after a bit of time of getting used to it about that that routine concept. And you know, all of this, you know, delayed gratification, and it's so hard. It really is so hard. That's why the things that I mentioned are meant to reduce the friction. Right. You know, when you when you have a goal, you're like, okay, or you've registered for something, or you have a let's say your best friends all rent you know from a college or high school rented a beach house in the summer, like okay, you know, you know, I need to get in shape. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. So you, you you create this urgency that forces you to change behavior. But having the person that you're paying for ideally, yeah that 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 person is holding you accountable you know it, it allows you having to borrow from one of your terms genuine sohba right helps you overcome a lot of this stuff so i remember one time i told you this one specific workout remember you can carry the boy <laughs> you remember my wife brought it up i was here. like so I, in my mind i was like okay i'm gonna leave the gym i want you to do that workout but then i was like there's no way he's gonna do it He's gonna spend five minutes on the treadmill. It's a I know it's a very difficult one hour workout. Yeah. He's not gonna do it. So I was like, I I I literally stood there for an hour, yeah. and I was like, I don't trust you, yeah. <laughs> because I know I know you're about to go to the next level, and there is you know there is like Sheikh Mukhtar says when you go from state to state, there's a lot of turbulence, and yeah. the easiest way out of the pain is to go back down. Yes, and so I was like. And so I was like, okay, he's about to go to a step level now. Like, you know, and most likely he's not going to do it. So I physically stayed there. 
And so having people in your life that are invested in your goal helps you overcome yourself. Like I, I don't believe in this notion of like white knuckling things mm -hmm. and like overcome yourself and hustle culture and you wake up by yourself. And, they, you know, I, I believe that, you know, it, it takes multiple, you know, it, it takes sohbah to help you get to that next level. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. I think that if you were not there by my side when I was uh, carrying that, I think it was like 22 pounds on my back, or I don't even know what it was. 42 pounds. kilos. 22 kilos. Oh, yeah. Oh, 50 okay. pounds. I'm thinking 50 pounds. Ahmed, what were you doing to me, man? 50 oh. pounds on oh, a 10, on a 10 uh, degree incline. Let's see what this guy did to me, Sajjad. Put 50 <laughs> pounds on my back. Unbelievable. But I'll tell you this if you were not there, I would have gotten off like I would have waited for you to leave MacFit and then like 10 minutes later I've been like, yep, went great. And I remember one time you put me on the treadmill and this is actually really funny, but it was a great learning lesson for me because Ahmed usually him and I are very, you know, we have banter between each other. We joke, we make fun of each other all the time. And you put the speed on something. I don't know what it was. And you went to go do your workout and I was getting really tired. So I put the speed down and you came and you checked in on me and you said, what happened to the speed? And I was like, oh, I just pull it down. And you like got really serious. It was like a Paddington bear sort of, you know, when he's in the jail and he looks at the guy, he's like, don't you ever do that again. Don't ever speak about my Aunt Lucy again. I was like, oh my God, I was so scared. <laughs> you know, but that accountability, it really, it really helped me. And so it's like you're saying, like even in the spiritual realm, like, you know, the suhba, the companionship, when we have, um, when we have friends, Ahmed, who have intentionality, behind their lives they have purpose like we're not just yeah. waking up just trying to figure out what we're doing every day we say no we want to be people who are growing together spiritually in the way of allah and his messenger and we have these principles that we're working with and we also want to get in physical shape and you're together that accountability and that structure produces wonders exactly i remember the etikaf that we did together. Oh, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have made it past day three if it wasn't for you and, and there are other people. So it, 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 these are, again, universal principles. Like when you're doing hard things, never do them alone. Mm. You know, I, you know, find your tribe, you know, find your tribe, find your mentors, whether they're in the spiritual realm or the physical realm. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is 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 doing things alone like I, I run this like experiment in like you know in my professional world just to, to highlight that so i'll tell people how long do you think you can do a plank for mm. so this is a business context everyone always has the same answer you know one minute and the people have never planked before but then I tell the whole room okay you're gonna plank now what what the time do you think people reach wow uh, you know i think the inertia the, the, maybe a minute and a half Two minutes, always about two minutes. Wow. And so there's something about being together that we've lost in the age of like being WhatsApp Muslims. Like we're all great friends on WhatsApp. It's just a bunch of crap. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I wish they would replace the name with what's crap. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's I, true. Like, did I say that word? <laughs> the yeah, don't, don't, don't go beyond that limit. Yeah, okay, that's okay. You know? Yeah. This actually came to my heart. I go, yeah, but, but real genuine. And that's what made Istanbul special it wasn't that it wasn't that you know the captain pasha really as much as like the messiness of like us living together really yeah. as opposed to hey hey love you you know you're in my dua yeah, <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know it's just yeah. like really like you have to see the person and interact and hey did you why didn't you i haven't seen you at Fajr. i haven't seen you in the, this i haven't seen you like that it, it's you know it's just so missing now yeah. You know, I'm going to even say even in our, in our own communities here in the States, like most interactions that people have with each other, is they, they're at the fundraising dinner at the masjid or, you yeah. know, they pass by and they see each other at the mosque. So you, you're interacting in a very beautiful place, but it's still a very sterile, sterile, yeah. sterile environment that's there. You know, the Sahaba. They live together in the nitty gritty, like they got upset at each other. You know, one guy said this about the other. And so they had to learn how to collectively process that and still, you know, get through on the other side as very close friends and companions. 100%. And, and I feel like, yeah, just to your point, like it's all like, oh, he's my best friend. Like, what do you mean he's your best friend? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's, you know, having real having like fostering those real relationships in your life 
help you achieve these more difficult goals. Like, right. so again, it, it's it's the first thing is to create the goal, register, then have hire somebody and, and find your tribe. Yeah. Like, really find your tribe. That because uh, uh, you know that you know the whole, the famous quote: "You're you're the average of the five people you spend most time with." Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know. I, you know, I, I thought I was special until I came to Istanbul. I'm like, wow, I'm a loser. Like, these are special people, right? And, you know, you find your tribe that elevates you. Uh, and then the, the last thing I recommend to people is, like, don't change too much, you know. You know, don't attempt to change too many behaviors mm. because you become overwhelmed by the sheer number of behavior changes. It's kind of the advice that the Prophet والسلام, you know, gave people when they became Muslim. Like, you know, that this is a very serious matter. This deen is very serious. So you you take it, you take it in gradually. You don't, you know, exactly. try to overwhelm yourself with everything about it. But I, I want to concentrate now on something that you did that I think is the tribe that everyone should be joining. Uh, it's something that, you know, I was just so touched and so moved and inspired when, when you put this together. 114. Can you show everyone your shirt? Can, 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 can everyone clearly see your shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can see your shirt. You know, the 114, you know, which, which you talk about strengthening your body and conquering your nafs. And we'll show the website in a minute or so. Uh, but Ahmed, uh, tell everyone what's 114? Why did you start it? And what's this whole thing about? So... The first of all, you know, I love this logo. So basically, this is uh, mountains and the Quran in green, mm. uh, because you know, being in the mountains is just so fundamental to our tradition. Uh, it's where you know our, our prophet went for solace for Khadwa. It's where you know uh, the, the Quran was first revealed, and one fourteen is the number of chapters in the Quran, and so. Uh, the the idea was to actualize the three things that I just mentioned, you know, create a goal and find your tribe, and you know, so like how, how do we? But not just in the physical realm, the physical and the spiritual, mm. right? And the whole thing, like this, we we create this thing in, in our races, which says, you know, uh, strengthen your body, conquer your nafs. It's also something I learned here in Istanbul. Um, and so, you know, I, th I thought, okay, fine. I do these physical challenges. Like I run long distances or people run long distances. What, what's the equivalent if I wanted to challenge myself spiritually? Mm -hmm. And I thought about long and hard and what would that look like? And, and really the thing that I struggle with the most is memorizing Quran. Mm -hmm. It's really, really difficult. I'm like, what, what does it take to memorize the Quran? Consistency, yeah. routine. You know, you can't like who do you have to become and who do you have to change to be to memorize the Quran? There's certain things you can't do, can't look at. Um, I was like, and my nephew did not like it. That's how I knew I was onto something. I'm like, no, memorizing Quran, that, that's that can't be it. So when my nephew didn't like it as an idea, I was like, that must be the idea. And so I, I created 114, which which is this challenge where it has multiple levels that require you to run a certain amount and memorize a certain amount. So mm. the lowest level is called the kingdom, in which you memorize a Sut al-Mulk, three pages, and run three miles or three point two miles. That's like that's the entry. That's the the entry level, and then the heart. Okay. So you have a, then the heart, which is memorize Sut Yasin, which is the heart of the Quran, and run a ten k or six point two miles. Then the cave, which is what most people do, is memorize Sut al-Kaf and run a half marathon. Then the heights. Uh, which is Al-Araf, uh, which is memorized. So it's Al-Araf, which is about 26 pages, and run a, a full marathon. And then the cow, which is memorized Surat Al-Bakra and run 50 miles. Now there's something above that, but that's like you have to unlock it. To, you, have to unlock it. <laughs> you have to unlock the final, you know, if you do the cow, of which so far four people have done it, uh, was completed four times, then you can unlock the higher level uh, you know i absolutely love this ahmed because what you've done is you've combined spiritual progress and physical progress together yeah and you know just uh, we could pull up the website uh, sajad and everyone that's listening i mean if you want to get started or if you're even started on your own fitness journey this is a great place to 
start or continue your fitness journey with spiritual purpose to be part of a suhba, a community of people across the world, not just in the United States who are doing the same thing that you're doing. I mean, look, over 20,000 ayats of Quran memorized, over 2,000 miles have been run. Uh, you've already done six races. You have over 500 racers. Uh, and I know you're in New Jersey. You have a virtual race. Uh, you have one, of course, here in Maryland with my people. <laughs> Your people are awesome, by the way. Hey, listen, Imam Sami Zaharna, Tamim, oh, yeah, the Muslim yeah. Family Center, uh, Amen, Hussein. Mashallah, Hussein's an amazing runner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and increase him. Uh, yeah, our, of course they're awesome. Well, what, Sajad, we have Sajad. <laughs> you know, and there's a there's a mailing list that people can join now. You know, um, this is amazing, Ahmed. I mean, I, I I absolutely I absolutely love this. Can you tell us like when when are the next race? Well, they're they're here, but when are the next races? So you know, we have a race in uh, in March, which is a virtual race uh, post Ramadan. I think okay. it's uh, and. Uh, we have a one in September in New Jersey, one in Maryland. I think it's going to be in October. One, and we're trying to launch one in Egypt and one in uh, in Istanbul. Like, okay. So, so there are virtual versions. Like people can do it anywhere. Download the app and do it. And then there are on the ground like actual races that people can attend. And we're trying to add a location a year. Yeah, and what I would say to anyone out there, look, like whenever, uh, you know, this weekend I'm going to RIS, but I'm not going to go to RIS, the Reviving the Islamic Spirit Conference, to go see Sheikh Mukhtar. I'm not going alone. Uh, I don't want to drive in the car alone. So there's 10 of us that are hopping in a van, mm -hmm. and we're going together. And so anyone out there that wants to take a journey in life, this journey, don't do it alone. If you are in yeah. a city somewhere in New York, uh, not in New York, in America or wherever you may be, get some friends together. And, you know, start a chapter of, you know, uh, 114 together, contact them and get moving together. Yeah. And the amazing thing is the community. It's That's the best part is the community. Like you mentioned Hussein and you mentioned Sheikh Sami. And there are people, what you realize is that there are people that are amazing at um, the, the Quran. is like they're so infectious with their love of the Quran. That's not the thing that comes naturally to me. But you're so infected by those people in such a positive way, their love of the Quran. And then there are people like Muhammad Arif and other folks that run, you know, they finish work and go run 50 miles. That's incredible. You know? And and Hussein and all those people. And and then you have the tunts. I mean, there's nothing more inspiring than the tunts. We have the tunts that, you know, will do sick you know the 6.2 miles and you know you'll see them doing their tunt run you know <laughs> you know it's amazing and to me that's the, the tunt run is more amazing than somebody doing 100 miles yeah and, and starting to memorize and people because the, the biggest blocker by the way is is the quran because your nafs really doesn't want you to do it like fine yeah. you want to go for a walk go for a walk but memorize the book of allah that's 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 for the kids yeah that's yeah. for the kid you know, that's for sunday school the kids we were too old for that although the fight the irony is that you know Sayyidina muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, and the sahaba all memorize the quran it's not like when they were children yeah. <laughs> you know they all memorize as adults right yeah. and but for us it's the realm of memorization and they'll say you hear every excuse under the sun like well you know well, we're not Arab. Well, neither are most of the Hafadah. I know actually all the Hafadah I know are not Arab, <laughs> you know, right. and and so it, it, see, being part of this community and being having people around you that tons that are starting to memorize and Ammuz and my father did and he was 82. Oh, you, know, so he's, you know, he's uh, and then you know, my daughter Sulafa was inspired by you know, somebody from New Jersey, uh, named Daniel, who's an amazing athlete, and so she did the marathon, you know, at 14. And so w when you see people around you do extraordinary things and it becomes your tribe, the extraordinary doesn't become that extraordinary anymore. Yeah. Uh, and you know what's also so amazing about this? Because, you know, through this whole process, Ahmed, you're unlocking potential, right? You, when someone starts this process and goes through the hard work, you're seeing, we're seeing, I'm seeing what potential I have to do things.
Yeah. And when Allah starts to show you that potential, you start to think in the framework of, well, what can I do next? Mm. The beautiful thing about 114, and I talk about it all the time, it's like this amazing Sadaqa Jariya project that you put together. You get people to get physically in shape, which the Prophet ﷺ was in incredible shape, and you get people to connect to the Book of Allah, to connect spiritually. Yeah. Now, if someone starts this process themselves, who knows what potential mm-hmm. they unlock in themselves five years from now or even three years from now? Because they can go on to do amazing things as well. It's like the, the saying, like, you know, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. If not, yeah. then do it today. And so, you know, when I when I see the Ummah of the Prophet, والسلام, it's just such an incredible Ummah. Sidna Nabi والسلام, is our Imam, he's our Sayyid. And every day the community is just amazing me with its generosity, its resolve, as you and I are watching every day what's happening in the yeah. And we're amazed with what's happening in Gaza. So I only see that there's amazing potential that everyone has if they just started the process of unlocking Ahmed. Yeah, and it's, like you said, there's such a compounding effect, you know. I I didn't know really what this word nefs was before the program that you created. So you don't know, you don't know, like, what impact you can have by just starting to do something like the Sahaba program has bred so many different and birthed so many things and well, I mean, which one? Not to cut you off but talk about unlock potential mm-hmm. potential i remember in the Sahaba program so the Sahaba program everyone can look it up it was a 11 month program that we did in istanbul uh, headed by sheikh Mukhtar Magrawi, who was teaching the islamic sciences and we had an arabic component to it and when your son yusuf came to the Sahaba program how old was he Oh my God! <laughs> uh, maybe 12, 13. 12, yeah. 12 or thirteen years old. Yeah. And I remember what started happening on Thursdays. Sheikh Mukhtar wanted us to start to move to another level of yeah. our uh, connective tissue to Allah, and he had us sitting in the mosque quietly reading Quran and doing dhikr, and it was yeah. two and a half hours long. And I remember the first time Yusuf came out, he was crying. Yeah. And he's like, Ammo, I can't handle it. Ammo, it's too much. It's like when you put yeah. me on the treadmill and you're like, run for half an hour straight. I'm like, Ammo, 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 Ahmed, yeah. I can't do it. And you're like, Mathasim, run. Yeah. And Yusuf did it. And then the Thursday after got easier and it got easier and it got easier until he was just like two and a half hours, no problem. And yeah, like, so. yeah, go ahead. you need somebody sometimes to say, do it. And and forget Yusuf. Like I was, I was dying inside. You yeah. know, like the idea of me sitting down quietly for two hours. I'd rather run a hundred miles. I'm not even exaggerating. I'd rather run a hundred miles than to sit two hours quietly. You know, it's uh, oh, like five minutes, six minutes. Like I'm thinking, people can't go. I can't go to the bathroom without taking their phone with them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting down quietly for two hours. You know. It's a crazy world we live in. And if you just look at the screen time that most of us are spending on the phone, and and, and again, that's lost potential. You know, we're no longer reading, we're no longer exercising, we're we're no longer interacting with each other and, you know, exchanging thoughts and ideas. It's just scrolling on Instagram and on the tiki taki, you know, you know about this. Exactly. And and so, like, one thing in 114 we tried to do really hard is not just these challenges, but create the community. Yeah. And so, we have these like community. Like everyone's on a WhatsApp group. Like we all use Strava together. You can see what everyone is doing. And so when you see this person has d- done X amount, right? You're like, oh, what am I doing? You know, and you know, it's not exactly like us living together in Istanbul, but we're trying to create a real community to the extent that we can. Yeah, and, and I'm also uh, Sajad. Can you open up? Uh, just go back to 114 again. I want to show something. If you go to challenges and just uh, click on results, New Jersey 2022. This is actually. I'm sorry. Results. Uh, um, are we supposed to show the results? Uh, Maryland 2023. I mean, this is really beautiful. It shows you know, Mashallah. We have that pulled up there. Like this is absolutely beautiful. Like Hussein Azuddin, a local brother from our community, mashallah, memorized Surat al-Baqarah and he he did his run, mashallah. And then you had all these other people, Surat al-Kahf. 
uh, than all these people who did. So look at all these people who are memorizing the book of Allah, you know, Surah Al-Mulk. Like, look at all these names. Musa, da, Musa, you know how old Musa is a young boy. Musa is like regular at our dhikr, and he's like, this kid's incredible, subhanAllah. And look at all these names, Hasib, you know, Hasanat, all memorizing the book of Allah and doing these races together. I mean, and this can be for anyone that's out there, this can be your community. Like, if someone is not taking the initiative to do this where you're living, then you take the initiative. You be the uh, the maverick who starts it. And uh, I think this would be something so beautiful. Uh, Sajad, I think you and I have to commit to running. Uh, <laughs> are, you, are you and Sajad? Are we in? Sajad says, "Let's." He, he likes to. He's a cyclist. He likes to do cycling. And well, I like. You can, you can cycle to the start of the race and run. <laughs> Allah barakallah fiqh Ahmed. It's been uh, it's been really wonderful uh, chatting with you. I wish we we had even some uh, longer time to discuss this. But any any just you know parting advice that you want to give everyone before we uh, before we go. You know, l learn to hear your nafs. You know, yeah. just be, stay quiet enough to say, okay. Like for example, you go to the. If I say, if you're watching this right now, go and register right right now. And then if you just listen, you'll hear your nafs talking to you. And if you want to get really weird with it, record, like actually like listen to your nafs, what does it tell you? And then give yourself a voice memo and then re-listen to yourself. But, you know, that's maybe a bit extreme, but no, I don't think learn, so. learn to listen to your nafs. Your nafs actually is, is very loud. It's yeah. very, very loud. So if I say, hey, go register right now, and then, yeah, li listen listen to your nafs and see what happens. Um, yeah. And once you listen to it, then register. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then go yeah. actually register. Push back. Do the, you know, that, <laughs> exactly. Because that's it. It's just, it's, it's a conversation. I mean, one thing I learned in Istanbul, the, probably the most enduring lesson i got from istanbul is this idea of nafs i mean i, I used to always think about shaitan 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 you know that shaitan is doing, tell me to do bad things shaitan shaitan and you realize that your shaitan is just like this like nah this is you just say it says something goes away your nafs right. has like your your nafs is in you it's like a toddler that's like baba baba give me a phone baba baba give me your phone baba 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 it just non-stop and and that's why we, we created these these bands, these conquer your nefs bands, because just to think all day, you know, the thing has a tactical advantage over you, it knows everything about you. And so, yeah, parting advice, go register. And then once your nefs talks to you, listen to it, and then ignore and then actually register. There you go. Ahmed Fahmi, thank you so much for your time. The website, everyone, is 1141. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all on this path. Ahmed, I hope to see you in Istanbul soon. InshaAllah. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.